right. We are about to start our afternoon program that includes three fantastic panels uh, on very pertinent topics. Uh, the first, uh, women's health issues and how the war on women has been affecting Democrats, Republicans, <coughs> independents, non-affiliated, young, old, everyone. It's such a shame that we have to spend time talking about it, but since it's happening, we do have to spend time talking about it and understanding what it's all about. So I'd just like to introduce our panel, uh, Marie Corfield, uh, who, who you have met. Uh, Marie has uh, running for assembly. Maureen Bella from Hillsborough, who has run for state senate and Hillsborough Township Committee. Yeah, uh, she's an attorney. And she's going to be talking along with Sonia Martin, who I think all of you know. Uh, and we have a fantastic wealth of information to share with you and the three best people in the world to give it to you. So thank you all very much. They want the mic. Uh, well, Hello. I'm glad everyone is still here after this fantastic morning we had. We have to be proud, and I think we have to give ourselves a hand for just a, a really great morning. For now, what we're doing on this panel is just right in front of what's happening in every campaign in every state right now. It's no longer women's health issues. We all know it's the war on women. And that is a phrase that you'll hear from both sides and hear it torn apart and reanalyzed and put back together in a lot of different ways. But it, it's, it encompasses a lot of things and a lot of issues that are pertinent. So I'm glad you're here to listen to it. And I appreciate that. First, my name is Maureen Bella. But I am here with Sonia Martin, who has put together this panel. And I'm very proud to be sitting with her. Sonia's been the committee woman in town uh, for a long time, two, uh, four, years. four years. And uh, since then, she is always willing to part her wealth of knowledge and to give anyone information on anything, any back history of the town, and give you the time of day when you want to become involved in Hillsborough politics, and it's greatly appreciated. And to my right is my running mate from last year, Marie Corfield, who is our party line candidate for the 16th district, who's also um, familiar with women's issues as well, and is an educator. Uh, when it comes time to the hat I'm wearing today, my hat begins with my legal hat. As an attorney, I speak to women every day about their lives, what they're doing, and, and how they're going to go through to the next step if they're in, in the middle of a change. A lot of times this deals with divorce. When women are going through a process and they have their health care for their family and they go through a divorce, they lose their health care benefits overnight. It is one day they have it, the next day they don't. And arrangements are made for children. Well, who's going to carry the children, who's going to pay for the children's health care? But arrangements are not made for that woman or that spouse. And it could be, could be the man if the woman has the, the job. But there are many, many positions that don't give health care benefits. And um, a phrase that I learned from Sonia was, we're all just one job away from not having health care. And that, that's a scary thought. So the war on women is, is one aspect of it. But the actual ability and who we know that need the benefits that you receive from, from the resource centers, and who are these women? If they figure, that's not me. I don't know anyone there. We, I, I don't use a clinic. Well, guess what? We know a lot of people. You may not know they're going, and, and that's where their doctors are, and that's where they go to, and that's where they get their cancer screening, and that's where their mammograms are done. But you know them, because it's the middle class people, the middle class women that are out there doing this. And when someone loses a job in their family, benefits go away. And once the benefits go away, I, I talk to the women and the men and the families that are in the bankruptcy courts, and I look at the, uh, and sometimes there's a catastrophic event, uh, a health care issue, and we look at their benefits, and, and they look, we look at their bills. And their medical bills are astronomical, and that's what brings them to me in my office. And at that point in time, when, when they're, they're, we're going through what they have and what they don't have, I say to them, well, <coughs> what's your plan for obtaining insurance? Because if they don't have one, and we file bankruptcy, their bills are going to continue, and that's not going to solve their problem for them. 
So it, it's a constant worry for people. Where are they going? What are they going to do? And um, it, it's that's why I put this this little sign up because uh, it's going to sleep. Yeah. Which is this is this is. Um, it's not going to take oh, a second. Oh, you talk. It's, we're, we're, this is the direction we're going in. I have to read at the same time, though. Oh, okay. Sorry. No birth control coverage, no planned parenthood, no choice. <laughs> well, our government is going to follow right in the footsteps if we could. And, and I have women's health care on my Google alert. And every single morning, there is another issue um, between this morning when I was reading one issue, and now another law was, was signed. And um, so you're looking at Arizona now. This morning it was Texas. <coughs> what they're going at, Texas was attacking Planned Parenthood. And if there's any relation to Planned Parenthood in the clinic, and they're no longer covered under the laws of, of their state dealing with health care and funding. And then when you're looking at um, Arizona, what they're saying now is we're just, we're just cutting it out. We're, we're, we're taking away healthcare. Um, part of what I, I planned when I was putting this together was, was just reading through the history of where this all began. And I came across um, an article. It was written by Deborah Jacobs, the director of the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey. And it was posted two years ago today. So two years ago, she was warning us what was going to happen. And it was August 14th, 2010. And she said that no budget crisis can justify the evisceration of women's rights. Uh, she talked about the funding of the 50 health centers across our state to screen thousands of women for potentially fatal diseases, such as breast cancer and cervical cancer. The centers disperse birth control, conduct annual gynecological exams, and provide prenatal care so that all children in New Jersey enter the world with a clean bill of health, regardless of the parent's income. And she was warning us that we were going to lose this. And two years now, guess what? She was right. She was right. And not only was she right, but, but no one realized, I think, when it was first starting, how bad it was going to be and how many people are affected by it. She said in her article that denying access to health care is just another way of denying women the ability to participate fully in society. In 1992, the Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor acknowledged the link between reproductive rights and gender equality in an opinion that she co-authored, along with Justice Anthony Kennedy and David Souter. And I'm quoting, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated, O'Connor wrote, by their ability to control their reproductive rights. This ability is being attacked state by state, uh, attacked across the country, and, and just being taken away from us. We're going in such a wrong direction, and we have to speak out and say, stop. That's why this is an important issue. That's why this issue is going to be at the forefront of President Obama's campaign. We heard Jackie speak this morning. Health care is important. Well, women's health care is extremely important. And we have to be more aware of what's happening because when we have doctors and we have insurance and we have rights, we forget about what's happening out in our communities. And we can't do that. It, it, it's, I mean, there's so much information. Uh, uh, I, and I think Maurice might speak more about the Affordable Care Act and um, what that mm -hmm. means to us. Um, and and just, uh, just to look at the health services that are out there, the annual well woman visit, contraceptives, mammograms, cancer screenings, prenatal care, counseling for domestic violence. It's another issue that is near and dear to me because I, I do represent women in court for domestic violence. And it, it, it is a horrible issue to, to sit down with someone and hear about what's happened. Now, and I say I represent women, I represent anyone who comes to my office with the issue of domestic violence. But it's overwhelmingly it is women that come in with, with this issue. And the counseling that they need and what they go through and, and um, the basic health care and even mental health care for women. 
All of these are at no additional cost and, uh, under the Affordable Health Care Act and includes the first federal ban on sex discrimination in health care programs and activities. And to see this now being eviscerated is terrible. And um, I, I guess the, the threat is that the women who cannot afford it, whether it's temporary or full time, are going to be without and they're just going to be a burden on all of us with no safety net. Our safety nets are important. What we do for women and health care is important. And the fact that we have a governor who so many people look at and say, we're so glad you're watching our numbers, our money, and our budget, but they're not realizing how he's doing it and where the attack is coming from. Um, Senator uh, Loretta Weinberg ha has stated that when we pass a budget, it's going to always contain what we need for women's health. And, and Marie will talk more about the funding. But it, it's, we're always trying to put back or catch up. And, and the minute he has a chance, this governor would take away from us, and, and we would go without. <coughs> I met a woman last year in um, South Brunswick. She had already three breast cancer operations without any insurance and she was waiting for a fourth one and didn't know, that was, um, I guess, last August, and didn't know if it was going to be scheduled before March of this year. You can't, you can't have that go on. So funding is important. What we need and what we can do for women is important. But the way this is done is by all of us acknowledging that this is a real issue, whether it personally affects us or not. It's a major issue, much more major than we know. So the House Republicans are pursuing the most comprehensive and radical assault on women's health and reproductive freedom in our lifetime. Over just the last year, Republicans in Congress have voted repeatedly to limit women's, health, uh, women's access to health care and reproductive services. They voted to redefine rape. What does it mean that rape now has to be intentional? Is that insane? But, but that's what they're doing. They want to limit women's access to health care. Uh, they held a panel on denying access to birth control coverage with five men and no women. Uh, does that make any sense? They voted to give corporations the power to deny women access to contraception. And last year, they nearly shut down the government in an attempt to fund Planned Parenthood. And you'll hear a lot more about Planned Parenthood from Sonia. But as you know, it is a critical provider of the preventive services to millions of women in need of health care, including everything that I've said before, the cancer screening, the breast exams, the HIV testing. And Mitt Romney has already said, Planned Parenthood, we're going to get rid of that. So on the state level, the Republicans are, are trying to force through this very radical anti-women <coughs> legislation. Somerset County has uh, the, the Women's Health and Counseling Center. It's located at 71 4th Street in Somerville, New Jersey. All of the services that I've already said uh, are, are the services that they provide. Uh, they're not going to be around. They're not going to be able to do this. It's just the beginning of the end of women's health care unless there's a stop to it. So I, I hope this brings to light that it's not just the poor women that we're helping, but it's the everyday person and the everyday family person who either has just lost a job or is going through a divorce. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we do a question and answer now? No, why don't we? Oh, well, we'll do it all at the end then. Okay. Um, I actually have some handouts here that you guys want to. Um, Take and pass around, and these are kind of good to follow along about the um, the effects of Christie's budget and the effects of the, the the potential effects of the Ryan budget if any or all parts of it are passed. <coughs> um, and while that's going around, I forgot to mention before if anyone is um, like just keep this on your calendar. Um, Two weeks from today, the 28th, there's going to be a, um, a rally against the war on women in Trenton and uh, from noon till 4 p.m. and I will be speaking at it. They have speakers lined up. Uh, Loretta Weinberg is going to be speaking. 
Um, they have representatives from the NAACP, from the American, uh, Deborah Jacobs will be speaking. Um, uh, they have Jay Springer from the Garden State Equality, Garden State Equality, and um, uh, I forget who else, but there's a whole lineup. If you follow me on Facebook or Twitter, I've been putting it out there, and uh, information will be on my website pretty soon. And there are buses from, there's buses going down from Bridgewater if people want to go, and that information will be out there on my website too. So, um, so I'll start with the state because that is um, these cuts have affected us uh, and a lot of a lot of our friends and family and neighbors um, more so than the Ryan budget. In 2010, right after Christie was elected, um, he put in for the for the fiscal year 2011 budget uh, Medicaid coverage for family planning and other health care services for low income women and families. Um, he, the, the, the Democrats had 7.4 million in the budget for that program and he vetoed it. The, the shame about this is that the government, the federal government would have provided nine dollars for every one dollar that the state spent on this program. It is a vital service. Many women and families rely on this. He vetoed it and the Democrats did not have a super majority to override the veto and they could not get enough, they couldn't get any votes from the Republicans to, to side with them. So that has been cut. Um, the same thing ha happened in for the fiscal year 2012 budget, uh, six and which forced six family planning clinics to close and it, re it required others to reduce services and or hours and our um, Senator Bateman, uh, I believe it was he who said at our debate last year, well, there are plenty of other clinics still open. That was Jack. Like you know. Oh, it was Jack Cidrelli. Okay. So if you are poor, if you don't have a car, if you are eight months pregnant, and suddenly you have to find a way to get to a clinic that's 20 miles from your house as opposed to two miles, it's not so easy to just hop on a bus and, and get there. So this is really putting a lot of people at a, at a big disadvantage, and a lot of these a lot of these women will just end up not getting the care that they need. Um, and the NJ Family Care Program uh, has been a very successful program in helping. Um, it's a federally it's state and federally funded insurance program for low income families. For fiscal year 2011. Christie initiated a freeze on parents and caretakers whose income is below the 44-7 year uh, for a family of four who are not eligible for Medicaid. And uh, the 44-7 is the poverty rate. <clears throat> so he froze all new admissions. Increased the premium payment for adults in the program. So you're living in poverty or below the poverty level and you have to pay more. Uh, for your premiums, and between 10 to 15,000 people were affected, and the trickle down effect is 10 to 15,000 people, but it also affects their families because if you're sick and you can't get insurance and you can't work, you're most likely going to lose pay. Uh, in 2011, for the fiscal year 2012, he reduced the maximum income level, and this one is particularly shocking. Reduce the maximum income level for New Jersey Family Care from twenty-four six to five thousand dollars a year for a family of three. So that means that basically, if you're working at minimum wage, you make too much money to qualify full-time minimum wage. I mean, that is just—it's beyond humiliating. It's—you might as well be living in a third-world country. Um, he proposed eliminating coverage for family care participants that are paid for entirely by the state. So um, if they are not contributing anything, um, he eliminated coverage for that. And the Democrats, but the Democrats' budget rejected that proposal. So that part didn't go through, fortunately. Um, and then in the Department of Human Services for fiscal year 2012, cut 1.5 million to support 20 teaching positions to the Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. I personally teach students that were affected by these cuts. Um, these kids had to go without extra services uh, through no fault of their own, just because they were born with visual impairments. 
He eliminated seven million from this year's budget to support AIDS drug distribution program. Eliminated 10.6 million from the budget to provide legal services to middle and low income individuals. So if these people had um, legal issues with, you know, with anything, but you know, it, also with, with healthcare, if they were having legal issues with doctors or any kind of service they needed, the, um, that legal service was eliminated. And eliminated three million from the New Jersey after three after school program. So um, poor people who need aftercare for their kids, um, they're out of luck. And so those people that were working had to find, uh, have had to find other resources for their children after school hours. Then we go to the Ryan budget. And on, uh, I, I compare, on this page, it's the, um, what would be cut in the Ryan budget. And on the back of this page, it's all the things, all, and all the organizations and or people who would, be, who would benefit from it. So the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. Um, what, what the Ryan budget proposes to cut is um, allowing insurance companies to continue to charge women higher premiums than men for pre-existing conditions such as pregnancy, um, deny coverage to women, like I said, due to pre-existing conditions, refuse to cover maternity care, deprive about 17 million women access to affordable health insurance and Medicaid. Increase the cost of prescription drugs for Medicare beneficiaries and preventive care services, including contraceptive services. And as I'm sure most you know, you all know here, contraceptive um, contraceptive drugs are not just about preventing pregnancies; they do provide other health care benefits to women. And um, and uh, adequately spaced pregnancies are far more healthier for a woman than those that are not, and they are healthier for the family life in general. Medicaid, the Ryan budget will uh, cut 20% over the next 10 years and convert it to block grants. You will see block grants throughout this, and block grants are all well and good for certain services and certain programs, but when it comes to healthcare, with the, the fact that our uh, the cost of healthcare in this country just continues to spiral out of control, seemingly on a daily basis, um, more and more of the burden to make up the difference is going to fall on consumers and taxpayers. Over 14 million low-income Americans would lose coverage by, um, by the end of 2012. Would overwhelmingly affect poor women because they make up 70% of Medicaid beneficiaries. Medicare, uh, raise the eligibility age to 67. Replace Medicare guarantee with a voucher for people currently under 55. Vouchers would most likely not cover the full amount of coverage, so costs would be passed on to beneficiaries, a majority of whom are women. Uh, SNAP, the food stamps program. You know, the, the Republican candidates love to um, uh, blame President Obama for the fact that more people are on our, are taking advantage of food stamps now than ever before, and it's because we have we are in the worst economic recession since since the Depression. I mean, it's. It's not the president's fault, but thank goodness we have this program so that people can take advantage of this, so that people can eat. Uh, but under the Ryan budget, um, it would cut, uh, cut the program more than 17% over the next 10 years. It's the equivalent of 8 million people, mostly women, would not be able to access food stamps. Convert it to block grant program that would not respond to increased need during recessions. Supplemental security and uh, temporary assistance to needy families cut by $463 billion, and two-thirds of the elderly SSI beneficiaries, 86% of adult TANF beneficiaries are women. Social Security, um, it rejects, the Ryan budget rejects proposals to raise revenues from the highest earners. Um, I believe the earnings, Social Security, is um, you're only taxed on the first $100,000 of your income for Social Security. Anything over that, you don't pay uh, Social Security tax on. So if you make 20 million a year, the only thing you're taxed on for Social Security is your first $100,000. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very fair to me. Um, can you imagine if everybody, if, if all of the top earners in this country were to just pay a little bit more, um, what a difference that would make. 
And, and women, again, rely on social security to a greater extent than men because women um, generally live longer than men. Head Start, Pell Grants, Job Training, Housing and Energy Assistance cut 1.2 trillion over 10 years. And now we get to the things that the Ryan budget won't touch or will increase. Defense spending, increased spending by 200 billion over 10 years. Extend all the Bush tax cuts, including for, every, for the very wealthiest Americans, at a cost of more than five trillion over 10 years. Um, income taxes, cut the top personal corporate tax rate to 25%, eliminate alternative minimum tax, exempt all corporate profits earned overseas from tax. So in a sense, it would encourage corporations to, um, to bring jobs overseas. Uh, the cost would be approximately 4.6 trillion over 10 years. Bottom 80% of households would get only about 20% of the tax benefits. All the rest would go to the top act tax earners. And uh, capital gains and dividends um, maintain the current 15% tax rate. So this is what we're up against. And um, to bring it down, back down to a state level, to bring it back down to the LD16 level, um, after Donna Simon was uh, sworn into her position, she did an interview press release, and she said, I cut it out, saved it, and sitting on my wall, in my bedroom, I look at it every day. She said she fully supports Governor Christie's um, fiscal proposals, his budgets, his policies, she is right in step with what he wants. So if, um, if that's the type of representation you want in the 16th district, then that's what you will get with her. Um, but that's not what I will do when I get down there. Um, so, and I also put some information, I, I have the information about the Women's Health and Counseling Center in Somerville, their address, their phone number, and services they provide, and um, uh, it's a uh, it's a really good place, and it's a it's it's one that we need to make sure stays open and fully functioning in this county. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Ida if this information that uh, Marie has. Uh, research for us would be put on our website. Yes. I think all of our people know, have to know these facts. Um, I could talk about the Virginia governor who just signed a bill requiring transvaginal ultrasounds of women uh, that they must pay for. We, uh, the government requiring a medical procedure on a woman, not required by her doctor, not wanted by her, which she must pay for, passed in Virginia. But I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> I could talk about Pennsylvania, where Governor Corbett just signed a bill for the same procedure. And uh, apparently, not only do you have to have this procedure, but it has to be on a screen and put in your face to watch it. And uh, someone said, you know, you're just intimidating, harassing women. He says, well, you can close your eyes. Apparently, Republican governors and legislators throughout this country feel a woman's body belongs to them. And they have the right to do almost anything they want. But let's not talk about Pennsylvania or Virginia. Let's talk about New Jersey because RH3, the bill to defund Planned Parenthood, was sponsored by Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey. And let's talk about Leonard Lance, who at a town meeting in Hillsborough, which I attended, I asked him why he voted to defund Planned Parenthood. And he said, because I'm opposed to abortion. And I asked, well, do you know what Planned Parenthood does? And I got a dull stare. So our congressman voted for that bill. First of all, only 3% of all the services that are provided by Planned Parenthood have anything to do with abortion. Now, Rush Limbaugh, 
the voice of the Republican Party, de facto, has given the impression that the only people who use Planned Parenthood are promiscuous young women, like Sandra Flute, the Georgetown Law student, that they would not allow to testify in the House of Representatives on the women's health issue. I'm here today to tell you what Planned Parenthood actually does. Uh, could you give these out? First of all, Planned Parenthood, research has shown that one out of every five women in this country sometime in their life will use these services. We're not talking about teenagers, college students, single girls. We're talking about married women of all ages. And guess what? Men too go to Planned Parenthood. In Central Jersey, we have Planned Parenthood offices in Flemington, in Plainfield, in Manville. And on the back of this flyer, you see where the offices are in other parts of New Jersey. Now, Mitt Romney said he plans to get rid of Planned Parenthood. Here's another guy who doesn't know what it does. Planned Parenthood provides services such as I'm taking it from the Flemington site checkups breast exams cervical cancer screening hormone replacement therapy mammograms menopause and midlife testing and treatment pap tests, sexual education, routine physicals for women ages 14 and older, urinary tract infections testing, vaginal infections, women's health services of any number, including uh, testing for sexually transmitted diseases and treatment. It also provides services for gentlemen. And all at an affordable rate, and if you can't afford it, it would be free. Now, there are some states in the West where women are living in rural areas miles away from doctors. The only service they have is Planned Parenthood. You have Mississippi trying to close down these centers. And how are they doing it? By zoning, putting ridiculous requirements so that the offices cannot be maintained and, have, and they're forcing them shut. Folks, Margaret Sanger would be rolling in her grave. I mean, this is a woman who in the early part of the century went to jail because it was illegal against the law for women to use contraception. Now we know contraception, education, and services helps to prevent abortions because there are less unwanted pregnancies. Not to say it addresses the health problems, whether it be STDs or whatever that women face. And you're really focusing on women in area, areas in the country where there are few services available on women with limited financial resources. And as I've said, everybody is one job away. If you lose your job, you lose your medical benefits. This affects women across the board. I don't care whether you're Republican, Independent, or Democratic. There's a war going on. And it's not a coincidence that in the states where you have Republican governors and Republican legislatures, suddenly their primary agenda seems to be contraception. It's unbelievable. It is utterly unbelievable that we are now dealing with this issue, that we even have to deal with this issue. Now, um, there's a lot of misinformation about Planned Parenthood. I hope these brochures will help people to understand better 
what they do. But I have to say that for many women, if these Planned Parenthood offices are shut down, in New Jersey we've had women's resource centers shut down, and the bottom line is you have X number of people who need services. When you shut down offices, those people have to go somewhere. Now, unless you're a, a man or a woman with an STD or a, a urinary tract infection, you all know how necessary it is to get help immediately. You can't be on a waiting list. I'll see you in a month from now. What's happening in New Jersey is that there is now an inordinate waiting list for the remaining women's health centers that are open. Women are calling. There's just so many services and providers. If you close offices, these women have to find their help elsewhere. And the waiting is too great to address their needs. Um, I think women have to recognize that it's in New Jersey. We have congressmen, the Republican congressmen to the House of Representatives, all voted for H.R. 3 to eliminate Planned Parenthood funding. And when you ask them, what do you know? They know zippity doo dah. They are absolutely applying their, I mean, when I asked Leonard Lance, do you know what Planned Parenthood does? And the man cannot answer? But you voted to eliminate something? It's scary, folks. They are appealing to a very extreme right-wing agenda, but it's going to impact on every American woman. So I think we need to let people know what Planned Parenthood does, first of all. It provides a very essential service. There's one other comment I want to make, and this has to do with Obamacare. Of course, the father of Obamacare was Romney Care, and he doesn't want to admit it. But in New Jersey, that bill, that law, the Affordable Care Act, called Obamacare, in New Jersey alone, 3.3 million people no longer have a lifetime limit. There are people in New Jersey who have illnesses where they had maxed out. Now they're not maxed out. 628,000 women in New Jersey, as a result of that law, have preventative mammograms ex expanded. 876,000 senior citizens and people with disabilities who have Medicare have already received free preventive care, improved care under Medicare, because of the Affordable Health Act. 69,000 young people up to the age of 26 are now able to be on their parents' insurance plan. That's what's happening now. Two years from now, many more millions of people in New Jersey are going, who are uninsured now are going to be able to get affordable insurance. And it's all in the hands of the Supreme Court of the United States. Aren't we lucky? You hear it said that, oh, it could be a 5-4 vote. You're telling me this, all this reform could end up being in the hands of one person? And you have one Supreme Court judge, Clarence Thomas, whose wife is a paid lobbyist against Obamacare. You, they've got a problem because they've got a law that ha they have to determine constitutionality on, but parts of that law everybody likes. The rest of it they don't understand. They don't have a clue. These polls really fracture me. They take a poll. They, half the people say, oh, I like this part of it. Oh, I like this part of it. I like this part of it. The rest of it, they don't even understand. You cannot 
have an insurer raise, eliminate maximum <coughs> limits, provide more care for young people up to the age of 26, extend, uh, eliminate uh, the uh, pre-existing illness. You can't have insurers do that and not fund it. If you don't have the mandate, there isn't the money. If there isn't the money, all those things that we like and, and that benefit the people in New Jersey cannot be done. So I'm very interested in seeing how the Supreme Court and its wisdom expects to get around this. I want to suggest to you that we already have mandated health care. It's called Medicare. Mm -hmm. We already have it. This mandate is no big deal, new, new thing. We have Social Security. We have Medicare. It's all mandated. So um, all women really have to get informed. They cannot wait till their daughters are impacted or they're impacted or they lose their job and suddenly they don't have the care they need. This is very serious business and women are directly affected and their families. Not to say men. I don't think there are many men out there who don't want their women using contraception. I mean, I just don't know how many men want to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten children like the Duggars. I just don't think there's a groundswell for that. I just don't think so. I think if you were going to poll men and say, do you want your women, woman never to use contraception, or better yet, do you want to pay for contraception rather than have your insurer pay for contraception? I think most of the men in this country understand the issue, except for the extreme right. So, that's all I have to say in my fashion, but I do think that you have to realize that we have members of Congress who are part of this extreme position. Chris Smith sponsored RH3 to defund Planned Parenthood. <coughs> Leonard Lance, who is our congressman now, voted for that bill. So we need to be thinking about who we're sending to Congress. Thank you. Question and answer. Uh, Maureen, you mentioned that the Board of Women is going state by state. Uh, are you aware that the state of Wisconsin just repealed their anti-wage bias law? Uh, and and they, they asked the a reporter, I interviewed the senator who yeah, introduced the bill, and said, well, and he said, well, there is no wage bias in Wisconsin or anywhere else. And the reporter said, where did you get your information? And he said, Ann Kohler. Ann Kohler. <laughs> It's a great comment, and put it on Google Alerts and see what comes up every day from which state is taking another negative step against women. It is continual, and it's amazing when you look at it. You think it only affects us with our budget and our crisis, but it's every state right now. It is a, it is a shame. Yes? A couple of, couple of comments. Um, one of them is um, I think that we do the president a disservice every time we call the Affordable Care Act Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And we are just playing into the uh, wishes of the Republicans by doing that. So I think that everyone who comes in this room and thinks about this uh, health care situation should be very careful about what they call it. And we should call it what it is. And it is the Affordable Health Care Act, which sounds a whole heck of a lot more appealing to me than Obamacare. Um, and I think it's, in, it's really inappropriate to just keep uh, making it sound like we're hammering the president as much as they are. Um, secondly, I had to drive past Planned Parenthood in Manville as I came down here today, and there are people out there picketing again against Planned Parenthood in Manville. I think that at some point that we should consider getting some of those uh, I stand behind Planned Parenthood pink t-shirts and go out and I stand in front of their offices nice uh, on a Saturday or a Sunday, just like these other fools <coughs> doing across the street in front of the church with the, where they used to have the, the fetus picture. Right. Um, 
And just, just by way of a little history, um, I used to be the president of Women's Health and Counseling Center. And when I was asked to be the president, I told them that it was probably not a good idea because I expected that if I was appointed the president, the freeholders would cut my funding, cut the funding. And they said, no, 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 no. And I said, yeah, they will. And they said, no. And I said, okay, I'll be your president. And the freeholders cut their funding. <laughs> And at that point, what happened was this, was, this was in the 90s. Um, George Bush I was president. He had cut plenty of funding for Planned Parenthood at that point. So they were really suffering. They had a number of programs there, including the Rape Crisis Center. Um, they did some work with domestic violence and the Women's Resource Center. They um, took care of the, the CAP program, which was Child Assault Prevention Program. They had a number of programs in there that, that really addressed these issues. And they were facing a massive budget shortfall. And the Democrats in Somerset County saved Women's Health and Counseling Center. As, as the president, I spoke to a friend of mine, who some people may remember and others won't, but she no longer lives in the area. But she, had, she was one of the first people who really used computers to the, to the point that they could be really used for, for soliciting uh, information and sending out information. And, and we basically took the Democratic, Democratic mailing list from Somerset County and sent out letters to every Democrat in Somerset County. And with contributions of 10, 25, 50 dollars, some 100, but not too many, we actually saved Women's Health and Counseling Center, and that's why it exists today. And these, these are things that, that people don't realize. This has been going on a long time. When we put together the Commission on Women back in the 1980s, um, we didn't have a Commission on Women. The Division on Women had money available for rape crisis and domestic violence in, in the counties, but you had to have a Commission on Women because they had to provide a, a um, case study to show that your, your county needed it. Uh, I was with the League of Women Voters at the time. We went to the freeholders and said, why don't you appoint a commission on women? It would bring money into the county for these programs. Nick Bissell, the sitting prosecutor at the time, stood up and said, there's no domestic violence and rape crisis in Somerset. <laughs> That's what he told us. Christy Whitman was the lone, the lone freeholder, lone woman freeholder at the time. And we, we went to her and we bugged her and we made her bring it up every time and, she, and they still wouldn't do it. So the League of Women Voters went and talked to virtually every woman's group in Somerset County. We had more than 80 women's groups that signed on. I said, I don't care if it's the Garden Club. If it's got women in it, put it on this list. <laughs> and we went to the freeholders and we said, 35,000 women want a commission on women in this county, and it's not going to cost you a dime. It's a voluntary commission. So they finally appointed it. And two years later, we, after we'd done the study, we got, we got money for rape crisis and domestic violence. And the first year, the Rape Crisis Center didn't have enough money or didn't have enough volunteers to activate their program 24 hours. So they were just working during the day and they had more than 400 calls. You know, what's important in what Karen is saying you have to be is vigilant. you have, mm -hmm. but you have to have power. And part of the power comes not only through lobbying, but also holding office. Thank goodness we have enough women senators and congressmen in the House, congresswomen, who are standing up and taking to the airwaves and exposing some of the things that are going on. It's happening not only in Washington, but in the state legislatures, where in Virginia, the women legislators walked out. I think it's very important that we recognize we've got to get women elected to these positions. Because some of these guys just don't get it. And they get until it. They we get have, Sonia, they just don't give a damn. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, I think it's interesting that the Republican women senators who voted for the Blount Amendment to allow a boss to decide whether you're going to have contraceptive coverage in your insurance, after they voted for it, thank goodness, Olympia Snow of Maine said, I'm not playing this game. But she resigned. But Murkowski, the other Republican women who voted for it, voted for it, and then later on went back home and must have gotten an earful of phone calls, and they, they apologized for what they did. We need women elected. Now, the Somerset County Federation 
of Democratic women, whose representative is there. <laughs> Hi. Hi. And we have membership forms. That group has one objective, to train, support, and encourage women to run for office. And believe me, I think it is an outrage that there isn't a woman from New Jersey in the Congress of the United States. Yeah. It's obscene. And there hasn't been for a long time. The, la the last one was a Republican, Ro Marge Rockema, and then um, um, Millicent, Millicent, Millicent Fenwick. Millicent Fenwick. <laughs> but I mean, in the last 50 years, we have not had anybody. Now, this year, we happen to have Women running for the Congress from New Jersey. We need a woman up there. We need more women up there. We need Democratic women. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 But, uh, yes. Sonia, you're done? <laughs> what did you say? Well, I have one comment. You said uh, Olympia Snow has resigned. Well, she's not running. But me. I don't think Olympia Snow is going to go away. No. Oh, no, no. no. But she's not going uh, She may sense. not be in that position anymore, but she's not a politician or a person that's just going to suddenly disappear. But she's going to come Power is having the vote and trying to, and she will, she will play a role in a different capacity. But uh, this is not going away. Uh, I mean, they keep on doing it. Every day you hear another state legislature in, a set, in, the, in, met, in the red states coming up with the next crazy thing. Mm -hmm. Now it's all well and good. You can go to court and you can challenge it in court, and maybe two or three years later, you know, these things may be adjudicated. But women every day are being affected. For every Planned Parenthood or resource center that's closed down, these are women who have reduced access to health care, and it's a life and death situation. Well, there was a lawsuit filed yesterday by Planned Parenthood in Texas. That's right. But it's, it's going to take a long time to But meanwhile, it. women are, are suffering. How many women's lives have to be jeopardized before women stand up and say enough's enough? And you do that through the ballot box. That's right. And you get to do that in November. I know you're very close to your time limit, but I just want to want to say is my, my thoughts about my closing remarks is in the 1980s, the Women's Vote Project had a button that I proudly wore and I still have it tacked to my dashboard in my car. And it basically says, it's a man's world unless women vote. Well, true, and the unless was written in lipstick. Oh, uh, <laughs> nice. I'll uh, repeat vote. that. They, they didn't hear yeah. what you just said. Tax war? Back in the 1980s, the Women's Vote Project had a button out that said, it's a man's world unless women vote. Ah, it's a man's unless world unless women vote. vote. Say that with me, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's a man's world unless women vote. All right. We need to get a picture of that on the Bree's website. Yes. You have it in your car? I do. Okay. I'll take a picture of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have to clear the decks for our next panel. I'm sorry.